If you go work at a big company, you might get handed a team or you might be stuffed into a team and suddenly you're surrounded by people that uh, you may or may not want to be surrounded with for years. When you're building your own company, you get to choose. You get to choose who you're working with. People would show up to work for uh, a salary. They would stay late for equity, but they would work weekends and they would build relationships and have barbecues and all of this because of the culture, because of the people around you, not because of me or their boss or whatever, but because of the fabric that we created. I'm Andrew Beebe with Obvious Ventures. I'm one of the managing directors at the firm. Obvious Ventures is a early stage venture firm. We're 10 years old and we invest across human health, planetary health, and economic health. And over the last 10 years, we've turned it into about a little over $1 billion under management. We've been investing uh, in the seed and early stage, and we've made over 125 investments. And that's resulted so far in six IPOs and close to 20 companies being acquired and many people building extraordinary long-lasting businesses. I definitely didn't think about being a venture capitalist back then in my youth. You know, I created some businesses very early on as a kid, and I remember one of them, I was buying candy bars in bulk and then selling them retail at school. And I realized a couple of things. You know, it was whoever is closest to the customer always wins. You have a lot of margin opportunity, and you also have real control over what's happening. At the same time, I just realized that it's, it's just much more exciting and rewarding, and I think more impactful for the world to actually build things. Well, I mean, I knew in college, I had a lot of friends going down very traditional paths in banking and consulting. I knew I was going to do something different. Uh, I actually thought I was going to work in politics in Washington because I was always in my mind looking for ways to affect substantial positive change for humanity. I went to Washington, even though I was working in the White House and doing very interesting things at the, the sort of center of power, and I saw something changing with the internet. And I had always been a little bit of a computer nerd and and really into technology as a agent of change. I just didn't know how to implement it. And when the internet was really becoming emergent and the web in particular, this will be a more powerful tool for change and most definitely outside of the hands of government than anything I can do politically, at least at my age. I left Washington and I went to California and I uh, was helping a couple of friends build a internet development company. We were making websites for people. But then I joined forces with four other really close friends, and we built a company called Big Step in 1998 that was like a Shopify. It was like a very, very early version of Shopify at a time when very few small businesses were using the internet, so it was hard to find uh, the customers, but it was the same concept. It would allow other people to become part of this very exciting new world. And that, too, was a very, very fun time where everyone was a little bit crazy, willing to just work 20 hours a day and build something really special. 20 years later, as a as an investor, for sure, a lot of what I learned during that period sticks with me all the time. A couple of things. I mean, I think the human side of entrepreneurship matters more than anything. The teams that you build and the people that you partner with. It's one of the greatest gifts founders have. If you go work at a big company, you might get handed a team or you might be stuffed into a team and suddenly you're surrounded by people that uh, you may or may not want to be surrounded with for years. When you're building your own company, you get to choose. You get to choose who you're working with. You get to choose who you partner with, who works for you. We took that very, very seriously and we spent a lot of time thinking hard about the people we wanted to assemble, their talents for sure, but also their integrity and their passion. And, And those things came together to create culture and the culture really drove the business. I think people would show up to work for uh, a salary, they would stay late for equity, but they would work weekends and they would build relationships and have barbecues and all of this because of the culture, because of the people around you, not because of me or their boss or whatever, but because of the fabric that we created. So in 2002, we had gone through the uh, internet ups and downs. At that point, I was young and I had very, very long hair, you know, like down to my shoulders. I had big bushy ponytail and I rode a motorcycle and I was sort of like a cool 
internet founder. Harvard Business School had me come speak, and the first year students at HBS were so frustrated that they weren't in San Francisco right now because it was the coolest thing, and like guys with ponytails and motorcycles are running companies, and, and so they basically very politely, but in a frustrated way, asked me over and over again different versions of like, how can we be like you kind of thing. And I thought this was very funny because I would have never gotten into Harvard Business School, you know, and I said to them, you should all resign from school and come to San Francisco and the world is waiting for you. And this, of course, drove them insane because they can. They didn't want to leave Harvard Business School and they were frustrated. And then a year later, the world had changed. You know, my company was not doing well at all. We had to do layoffs, dot com bubble bursting. So Harvard Business School being very smart, they had me come back. <laughs> and it was the second, they were now second year students, they also were a little bit nervous because the bubble had burst. And so they kept asking a different question the second year, which was how can we avoid being like you? <laughs> so I said to them, it's really, really easy. You guys all should stay in school as long as possible. You know, go back to another graduate school or whatever. And of course it was funny, because they couldn't do that either. And in 2002, we made it through, we survived, and then we sold the business. And I took a year to think about, you know, what had just happened. And one of my reflections was that all of the things that changed about the world in a very short period of time was thirsting for what was the next version of that. And I ultimately chose solar as the most likely to be near term impacted by radical cost reduction. I just kept looking and eventually I found people who had some shared beliefs. We ended up partnering together to build a solar technology company. But the markets weren't as ready in certain conditions. A lot of the costs were still extremely expensive, so we were very heavily uh, dependent on subsidies. The corporate mindset around climate was non-existent. No one was thinking about it at all. So all of those conditions conspired to make it pretty tough. And so in 2008, we sold the company and, and then become part of a multinational company based in China, SunTech, uh, that allowed us to continue our work really radically expanding availability of solar and the cost uh, and radically reducing the cost of every solar panel made. And that was an extremely exciting uh, time. And it was after doing that for a while that the Obvious team came to me and said, let's let's do this and, and you can be a key part of it. The team that came together to form Obvious was Ev Williams, who was the founder of Twitter. When they shared that idea with me, looking at these three big pillars of planetary health and human health and economic health, there are so many opportunities to do huge things. I just knew that these were the kinds of big idea founders that we wanted to go find. I think that was a little bit different than what was the standard way to think about venture at the time. So our definition of seed versus series A, at a seed, I would say we're generally not sure exactly what the product will be, what the unique customer profile is, or what the product market fit really looks like. We also acknowledge it might, they might pivot along the way. You know, we built this artificial intelligence engine that was very general purpose, but then power developers just love it. So we're changing it to just suit them at first. And that's our go-to-market, you know, that's the beginning. Series A, we're typically looking for true product market fit, meaning there are customers who are buying the product, who like it, and who want to recommend it to others. And that customer, if we expand it to the addressable market, that customer size looks very, very big, or a smaller part of a bigger market that we could imagine, we could dream that it could expand to. So the difference for us is seed is team and a dream, but just a really, really strong, even kernel, beginning of a team, and uh, ideas that we share a vision for with the founders. And then at Series A, we're really looking for uh, clear evidence of customer traction. We're always looking for the determination and, you know, we say grit in the founders at that seed stage. And if it's there, I believe that building really, really diverse teams in the early stage is extremely important so that you can take a broad view of the world so that you can have different mindsets around the table and you can encourage really, really strong debate. At the same time, diversity comes in many forms. You can have diverse opinions, but you ultimately do need some shared values. Really trying to look for those shared values that they are then gonna to use to go filter and find 
the talent that's going to help them build. Because if you're in the first two years of your business and you make one or two big hiring mistakes, it's okay. You can fix that. You have to correct it. But the third one, the fourth one, or the lack of correction in the beginning can really prevent a company from lifting off. That's something we spend a lot of time on is uh, team and development and, and the strategy of what they want to do. And then at the Series A, ensuring that that is continuing uh, to scale, I think, is really critical. But then also just getting them to really deeply get into the minds of their customers. So even if you're using artificial intelligence to find geothermal resources underground, one of our companies, uh, Zanskar, does this, still... I think it's important for them to get that technology right, but also understand what Google really needs from a power consumption standpoint or what Pacific Gas and Electric, your utility in California really needs. All of that work is really important to us too. We have a great founder, Sami Inkinen, who started a company in the healthcare reversing type 2 diabetes without the use of insulin, which is a very hard thing to do. We thought maybe impossible. But when he was starting it, incubating it in our office, he very clearly said, I want to reverse type 2 diabetes in 300 million people. That was a big, hairy, audacious goal. It was also very specific. I think famously, Elon and others have done this in their companies where they have like a very clear master plan, a long-term plan, but it has multiple phases. Along the way, those phases could A, be huge businesses, and B, can be financially independent. So it's not just, hey, I'll start here, but it's going to be a money-losing business, and then I have to move on to the more profitable thing. It's I'll start here. This could be a really powerful business. It's going to be not nearly as big as this next thing. So let's go on this journey together. I think that kind of clarity of vision, even if it turns out it twists a little bit over time, I think that that's a very attractive to investors. When Obvious was created, we were looking for things that would stand the test of time, things that would offer big opportunities in perpetuity. And we do that across three big pillars, planetary health, human health, and economic health. So climate is a very big domain. Uh, There are areas like industrialized uh, decarbonization, like steel and concrete and others. So we just have to be venture capitalists. We don't have to be like religious zealots about, oh, if it says climate, we must invest. People are very much focused on find the winners where a climate investment model makes sense. To those people who just sort of want to burn everything and and, um, not worry about the consequences, the number of people who really think like that is actually shrinking a lot. Because of innovation, because of technology, we are able to offer a superior future, not just a different one, but a superior one that I think is going to show, prove itself to be more resilient, lower cost, and more available globally than anything before. 20 years ago, if the cost of solar was going to go down two orders of magnitude, you'd never believe me. And yet now we are cranking out gigawatts and gigawatts, like 100 gigawatts. The world is changing. Businesses are changing. Governments are adapting. I think it's possible that human behavior might be one of the last to change. The fact that people will be in an Uber and the Uber is a Tesla or the Uber is a Hyundai and and they're all electric and, and they start to realize, wow, this is just a better product. And that's where consumers will really kick in. If composting, recycling, and throwing out trash in your home somehow resulted in a better product that you could see every day, I think maybe we'd see more adoption. But I think the consumer behavior really comes when when it's an immediate gift of a better outcome. You know, we call our type of venture capital world positive venture capital. And that's because while we're mainly investing in the United States, we believe that companies there and companies everywhere have an opportunity more than ever not to just do something locally, but to do something globally. And if you do something globally, your market is bigger, your market cap should be bigger, your your company should be bigger, but you also have more of an opportunity to leave a lasting impact on society. So I hope that entrepreneurs here think about the ways that what you're doing might scale globally because there's a whole lot of challenges out there in the world and the more we can collectively work on them, the more we're going to have a healthy and happy society for generations to come.